you know, it was, it was a struggle. I really felt like I went, I, I had to go through alone because, you know, for a long time, pornography was a guy issue. Girls don't struggle with porn. So I was too ashamed to really talk to anyone about it. And plus with my parents being in ministry, you know, I didn't want anything to look bad on them. I mean, they didn't cause it, but I didn't want it to go back to them, you know? So it was something I felt like I really struggled by myself. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Naked Gospel. It is our vision and hope to see a revival of sexual dignity throughout the entire Bride of Christ. To that end, we bring on guests to discuss issues around sex trafficking, pornography, marriage, sexual ethics, and everything in between. I am your host, Shane O'Neill, and today we're joined by Allie Peters. Allie has had a really long journey through some of these issues, uh, as well as kind of the, the added problems of mental and social health issues, which has been a big part of my journey. Really excited to hear her story and have her on today. Ali, thanks for being here. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing all right. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. How how have you guys been holding up? You're down in Georgia with the whole COVID coronavirus stuff. I know some of the uh, you got some immune issues and concerns on your end. Is that right? Yes. Um, so I have two autoimmune diseases and there's only one medication out there at the moment that'll treat both of them. And it actually attacks the immune system. Wow. So uh, I'm kind of like someone going through chemotherapy at the moment. Hmm. So That's heavy. I was one of the people at high risk of yeah. getting uh, it definitely could kill me. So <laughs> kind of just locked down in the apartment. Yeah, I imagine you got to be pretty isolated with that stuff. Yes, and it will drive a person mad for sure. <laughs> I believe you. Well, uh, that only makes us feel all the more honored that you would join us today. So thank you for being here. Um, thank if you you're, for having me. For sure. For sure. Uh, if you're up for it, just uh, start. I guess from the beginning and just share uh, parts and pieces of your story with us, however long or short you'd like to be. Um, would love just to hear your story. Uh, sure. Um, I was born in 1990 and I grew up in a Christian home. And uh, I, I guess, I mean, my parents were in ministry. For, they have been in for a long time. And, um, when I was around nine years old there, I mean, I got bullied a lot growing up and like when I was five years old, I remember looking at myself in the mirror in a ballet class, you know, they have this whole wall covered in mirrors. And I remember looking at myself and just being filled with disgust and so much self-hatred I don't know where it came from but I just it was as if I was looking at a monster and I hated everything I saw and it's kind of stuck with me ever since and you know growing up I got bullied really badly to the point that I was later diagnosed with PTSD from it um, when I was around nine years old uh, there was this boy that was a few years older than me, about 13 or 14 years old. And um, he would want to play truth or dare with me. And he would want it to be just him and me. And, um, you know, the first time we played it, we played it in my room. And he dared me to lift my shirt up and I told him well, I'm not allowed to do that. He's like, Oh no, don't worry. I won't look. I'll cover my eyes. And being the naive nine year old I was, I believed him and I did that. And then a little later I was at his house. Um, and it was at night 
my parents were out of town, so his parents were looking after my brother and me, and we were in his room playing truth or dare, and he dared me to do some things to him, and I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, I didn't understand what I was doing. I just thought, well, this is just part of the game. But it sort of awakened some things in me. Hmm. Um, and I noticed that I really liked doing the things that he wanted me to do to him. But there was some guilt, like I shouldn't be doing this or this is this doesn't seem normal for my age. And I remember after that, just kind of obsessing over it and thinking, you know, when am I going to play this game with him again? When am I going to do this again? And just thinking over and over again and replaying that night. Um, later, I had my first suicide attempt. I had tried to hang myself. And I actually did not tell anyone about that suicide attempt until last year. Mm. I had forgotten about it and remembered it last year. Um, but that kind of started awakening, I guess, my sexuality. Yeah. And then when I was about 10, 11 years old, um, I was at, I think, I think it was about 11 years old. I was at a friend's house. And the reason I say around 11 years old is because I remember it was around when President Bush was president. Um, I was at a friend's house and we decided that we would go on her computer and look up the White House's website. Uh, we, we didn't know there was such thing as .gov and it took us to a, a porn website. And I remember looking at it and just being kind of intrigued with what I saw. Like, I, it was like I couldn't look away. And so that was the first time I ever saw pornography. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I grew up watching anime all the time. Uh, Sailor Moon, Pokemon, you know, those were my thing yeah, when I was little. Both. Yeah. And then um, I got into Dragon Ball Z. For sure. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I finally, about, I guess, a year later, so around 12 years old, uh, I got my own computer in my room. And we got the internet on there, and I got my first email address. I still remember my first email address because I thought, I got to think of something really special for my first email address. I came up with the dorkiest, most cheesiest email address ever. It was gokugirl at hotmail.com. So, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anime fan. <laughs> but... um. You know, I was on there and I um, I would go on websites like Neopets. That was really big back then. Um, and that's when I learned that, you know, I could have friends from all over the world because most people did not like me. I did not have very many friends gr growing up. Um, Bullying was so severe. I mean, there were there was a time a kid chased me with a knife. Hmm. Um, no, it, it it it's really hard to talk about some of the stuff that went on. Yeah. But um, so I didn't I didn't really have anybody, and I would make these online friends. Um, while I was on there, I guess some of the websites I went to, um probably sold my email address to porn websites. And so I started getting emails of pornography. Um, I also 
you know, my, my parents had security set up on my computer and I was able to get into that and change the settings and, um, you know, I could look stuff up that I wanted to, delete my browser history and change the settings back. Nobody would know. Uh, the um, things just got really bad socially. I got really lonely. I was diagnosed with depression. Um, I, I felt like... The, I, I, I always struggled, even to this day, uh, feeling loved by people. Um, I, I tend to be very isolated. And so I would look up pornography, though I didn't know it was called pornography then. You know, I just look up naked people, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, it was... It was um, a little, I think it was a little easier to find it back then. There weren't so many filters. Like you could go on Google Images and find stuff back then. Yeah. So um, I would I would do this for hours every day after school, um, and that would sort of take away the lonely feelings. And I had this screwed up mindset that associated what I was looking at as love. And so it was as if, you know, I can't get love from other people. So I will feel loved by looking at this. And um, it just, there, I, I have a lot of shame because there was one time um, I was looking at it and my brother, who's four years younger than me, uh, he came in my room and one of his friends, who was a year older than him, came in my room. And um, I just, I was like, hey, you know, come look at what I'm looking at. Hmm. And my brother and his friend got to see what I was looking at. Hmm. Um, so I have, I have a lot of guilt of that. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I really hated God then. Um, I just, I wanted nothing to do with him. You know, I believed he was real. I grew up in the church, but just everything that I was going through, I just, I did not like him at all. And, you know, I would, I would find myself telling him to F and get away from me. Um, you know, I, I was tormented a lot. Um, and then when I was about to turn 14, um, I went on my first mission, mission trip with my youth group and, um, the, uh, while I was there, it was ironic. I was in charge of my group for doing the devotionals every day. And, uh, the first one we did was Psalm 139. And it just, it stuck with me about how God is always there and how he knit us together in our mother's womb. Mm. And um, it's just this, this beautiful picture of, you know, God creating us and we being beautiful in his image. Yeah. But my heart was still hardened. And I still wanted nothing to do with him. And then I remember the last night we were there. And we were kind of doing this worship service. And um, I didn't hear, you know, I, I didn't hear an auditorial voice. But I, I kind of felt like I heard something in my heart. Yeah. And... This voice said, you know, I love you. No matter what you do or say, I will always love you. You've been through a really hard time, but I want to help you just believe. And it just, it shook my core. 
And I remember going back to my cabin that night and just weeping the whole entire night. I did not sleep a single second that night because I was just weeping the whole night and just repenting all night and saying, you know, God, I'm going to live for you. You know, I, I, I'm going to turn away from the pornography. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm done with all this. And so uh, I gave my life to Christ that night. And when I came home, you know, I was a completely different person. Hmm. And I told my parents what I had been doing for those few years. Um, we decided that we would take my computer out of my room and put it in an open area like my mom's office. Uh, I decided that I would not use the computer for a year except for, um, you know, doing schoolwork. Yeah. And then I also did a program, which was free at the time. It's not anymore, but triple X church. Yeah. Um, you know, I downloaded their program. You know, we didn't have smartphones back then, so it was just for the computer. Um, I believe they gave, they had you, have three accountability partners. So I had my mom, a youth leader I trusted, and I think my youth pastor. And this program would basically, if you went to a porn website, that website got emailed to your accountability partner. Hmm. Um, and then that year, the other thing I did on there was I would watch videos they posted on YouTube because that was when YouTube kind of just came out. Um, but you know, it was, it was a real struggle and, uh, I ended up moving that year. So, you know, that also limited my communication with the few friends I did have back at my hometown. Mm. Um, there was one night about a year after I, became a Christian and I don't tell people this very often. Hmm. Um, I was going to sleep and I had this vision. And the reason I say it was a vision instead of a dream is because I was not asleep yet. I was fully awake. And um, in this vision, I was in this room, no wall, ceiling, floor, and it was dark, there were no windows or doors. And all of a sudden, like everything, the walls and everything, I was surrounded by the pornography I used to watch. Hmm. And I could hear sounds coming from them and it just, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I, in this vision, I just fell to my knees and I closed my eyes shut and covered my ears with my hands and. I'm just crying out, please stop, please stop, please stop. Yeah. And um, I felt as if someone had wrapped their arms around me. And it, I looked and it was a man, I believe it was Jesus. And I just kind of buried my face in his chest crying. And he told me it was gonna be okay. The vision ended and the images were gone from my head. Hmm. And I fell asleep. Um, I did, um, I did not look at porn for a few years. Uh, I did get back into it, um, a little later after I graduated high school. Um, I had an online boyfriend at the time and, um, he, he was looking at pornography and I, um, I was really devastated by it, but I, I was afraid because he had broken up with me once before and I was afraid that he'd break up with me again. So I did something I did not want to do because I wanted to keep him and I sent him pictures and videos 
that were porn pornographic of myself. And at first, he was really happy about it. I mean, he was saying, oh, you're so beautiful. And of course, I really like being told that because, you know, one of the things that I got bullied about a lot was my looks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, someone telling me I'm beautiful is not something I heard very often. But I kept doing it. And he... Um, he realized I was not comfortable with what I was doing. And I think he knew from the beginning I wasn't because I told him, you know, he had said he was Catholic and I told him I wanted to wait to have sex until I was married. And he called me a nun for it and said, well, I'm going to change that about you, which should have been a red flag for me, but I'm the kind of person that does not see red flags. And so this went on for a few weeks and then he told me to stop because he could tell I was uncomfortable. So I stopped and then he broke up with me. Hmm. I was devastated. Um, turned out he was interested in a friend and I'm like, well, I want him to be happy. Right. Hmm. So I hooked them up. But I was just devastated about it all. Uh, he was the first guy that really made me feel beautiful, and I lost that. And so I had another online friend, and um, I wanted to make my ex-boyfriend jealous. So, um, you know, I, uh, I did the same thing with this friend and we also did cyber sex mm. um actually funny story about the cyber sex is i fell asleep during it mm. <laughs> and so uh uh he was just kind of like are you there are you there and the next mm. morning i'm like sorry i fell asleep mm. but i felt really guilty about it all um I was in college at the time, and I I felt like a total slut, honestly. Mm. Uh, just felt like I was really selling myself, and uh, I knew what I was doing was wrong, and uh, I just, you know, my my ex boyfriend then turned on me. He got really abusive towards me. And I had a major suicide attempt where I had a major drug overdose. And my mom found me eight hours later. And doctors say that I really should be dead after that. Um, after that, my mom found some of the stuff on my computer that I had gotten into. So... You know, she, um, she put more stuff because I had a laptop for um, at my graduation gift from high school to help me with college. So that's what happened with that. Uh, she put a bunch of security on my laptop uh, to the point where internet would even shut down after a certain time. I think it was like 930. Um... When I got out of the hospital, um, that's when Nick, my husband now, had contacted me. Um, and uh, we, we started talking, and you know, he was a really good guy. We started dating, and we started talking in August, started dating September got engaged Christmas Eve and married in July. So it was very fast. Wow. Um, because I have some sexual traumas, uh, in high school, I was sexually abused by another student. Um, he actually turned out to be gay. Um, some of that stuff really affected uh, intimacy for us and so uh, I 
you know, for several months after we got married, we, um, we couldn't do things because it was too painful for me physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, I turned to some of my friends and asked for advice and they said, well, just look at, just watch porn and it'll, it'll help your intimacy. And I didn't feel good about that. I was like, mm. you know what, if it can help, I'll try. Um, I did that for about three days and then I quit because I felt guiltier about it and I knew what I was doing was wrong and it wasn't helping anyway. Um, that was basically the last time I had watched porn, but you know, the struggles were still there. I mean, there were times where I could watch even like, like I remember uh, Nick and I used to watch Arrow because we like superhero stuff. Yeah, and there was a scene with Oliver Queen and Felicity together, and this w this was actually just a couple of years ago. Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, we were watching it. There's a scene, and they're making out, and then you see her take her top off, but you don't see the front. You just see her bare back, and I was like, "Oh my god, I can't watch this anymore!" Mm -hmm. And like, I kept replaying that scene for weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, just something simple as that. Hmm. Um, you know, this, this kind of thing really affects a person. Um, there was even, uh, you know, I couldn't be around women who are breastfeeding uh, because that would trigger something with me. Hmm. Because another way pornography affected me was... Um, I became bisexual because most of the pornography I watched was lesbian porn. And I mean, for some reason, naked guys did not turn me on. Didn't mean I didn't like guys. Just, you know, it just didn't do a thing for me. Uh, girls making out apparently did. So, um... You know, that was, that was kind of a hard pill to swallow. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a struggle. I really felt like I went, I, I had to go through alone because, you know, for a long time, pornography was a guy issue. Girls don't struggle with porn. So I was too ashamed to really talk to anyone about it and plus with my parents being in ministry you know i didn't want anything to look bad on them i mean they didn't cause it but i didn't want it to go back to them you know so it was something i felt like i really struggled by myself and i remember a couple years ago um you know i started going to celebrate recovery for different issues uh i struggled because after I quit porn, I went to other addictions, such as self-harm. I started self-harming at 16, and then when I was, after I was sexually abused in high school, I started binge eating. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of jump around from one addiction to another. And so I started going to celebrate recovery to mainly deal with my cutting. And I remember one night they had like these mini testimonies going on and there was one girl that came up and she, you know, she said, hi, I'm so-and-so I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And I struggle with pornography. And I was like, what? Yeah. You know, another woman struggles with this issue. Hmm. And it just, it was a shock for me. Um, I still have not talked to people in that group about, my pornography issue but um it it just I, I it was a complete shock for me um but celebrate recovery has been helpful for me um and uh i guess that um you know it was just a few months ago actually 
uh, I was watching this series on Amazon Prime with Nick. And, you know, I didn't know that there was going to be nudity or anything in it. Um, but there was. <laughs> and uh, it was borderline pornographic, honestly. Hmm. But I noticed that it didn't do anything to me this time. Hmm. And I was, I was like, that's so weird. Why, why am I not obsessing over this? I mean, I, I watch it and then it's gone. And I remember even though I don't have the triple X church, uh, app or program on my phone or on my computer anymore, uh, I still subscribe to their newsletter, which is free. Yeah. And, uh, I remember they had a thing come up. It was some kind of quiz on, you know, are you addicted to pornography? And I, like you know what I know I used to be but I wonder if I still am so I took the quiz and I answered all the questions honestly and it came back with saying I was not addicted to it mm. and I just you know I just remember thinking this is so odd and realized you know God's delivered me from this because you know in the past even just seeing a bare woman's back would drive me crazy but I just watched you know a couple have sex and it didn't do anything to me and I just I, I almost started weeping then I was like hmm. wow you know God's delivered me from this you know what 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 about my other problems like like my cutting and my binge eating maybe he can deliver me from those too hmm. and it just it, it was it was an incredible feeling. Well, so I still have some, you know. I'm I'm not saying I would never get addicted to porn again. You know, I have to be careful. I'm not going to test that. And um, you know, I still have some residual effects. You know, a big problem I have is I fantasize, and it's not necessarily sexual fantasies, but uh, like. Like my, my priest, I, I go to an Orthodox church and my priest, uh, he says that I tend to live in fantasy a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because that's a coping mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to break free of that. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do, especially during this Lent season, it's been really bad. Um, I try to pray during then, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask God, you know, help me tame my passions. And I also say the Jesus prayer, which is Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm. And I'll just start repeating that over and over and over again until the thoughts go away mm. or I conk out because I'm exhausted. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, that's that's the main issue I have now. That's kind of a residual effect from the pornography is the fantasizing. Hmm. And it's just that feeling of wanting to be close to somebody. Yeah. So, because I don't, I could be close to someone, but my mental illnesses kind of isolate me and have this chronic loneliness. Hmm. So I could be in a room full of thousands of people and I'll still feel like the loneliest person in the world. Yeah. So. But yeah, that's my story. <laughs> I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Allie, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. It strikes me as extraordinarily brave. And thank you. It's remarkable what you've been through and where you are and how far you've come. Just really admire you and your journey um thank, thank you. you gosh so much for sharing that stuff with us i uh i know on my end um when it's come to mental and social health that's been a huge factor mm -hmm. in my own struggles and and mm -hmm. like the uh, like even the isolation piece i i I have no idea if this will turn off some of our listeners, but um, uh, when Harry Potter's um, 
uh, Godfather passed away, he there's this mm-hmm. line that uh, J.K. Rowling writes that she says, um, Harry speaking, he says, whenever I'm around people, all I want is to be alone. And whenever I'm alone, all I want is to be around people. Mm-hmm. And so that intense kind of loneliness that you were just portraying of even if you're yes. in a crowded room feeling unknown. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm convinced that people want to be loved and want to be known, that those are the yeah. two primary desires of the human heart. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I know that isolation and, and it seems like pornography or, or yeah, specifically pornography is, is such a, a kind of like easy medication in loneliness and in isolation. Cause there's, there's affection um, mm-hmm. and pleasure to be known in that isolation, but then it just ends up exacerbating the problems and making right. them more pronounced and just wrecking my mm-hmm. mental health because, because once you're done, you're so sober and you realize like you've just spent your passion and you're still alone, you know, right. and it just mm-hmm. ends up wrecking the soul all over again. Right. Yeah. How, yeah. And there's that, there's that shame involved too. Like, yeah. gosh, this is the only way I can feel loved. I can't feel loved by a real person. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then even like, I, I mean, you, you pointed this out of like, even, like who that person is and wanting them on your own terms, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and certain guys taking advantage of you in that way. And then yep. you also experiencing that in your own ways as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's helpful to hear too, cause so many people, uh, primarily Christians view this as just a male issue. And so right. like, you know, like the guys go one direction, girls go in another direction. They talk about girl problems and guy problems. And for the guys, it's always pornography. And for the girls, it'll be something about like image or something like that. Right. Um, but like so many women struggle with this and mm-hmm. there just aren't a lot of resources for them. So I, I think your story right. is especially important for that reason. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again, just for being so brave and sharing it with us. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's also that aspect too of, um, there are in kind of secular culture, there is this idea that pornography can be used for, for intimacy in marriage right. or in relationships and those kinds of things. So it's, it's interesting mm-hmm. to hear that piece of your story where like, like one, no, it didn't work. And two, it really wrecked me, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I think yep. there's so many, so many uh, facets and factors of your story that are just really significant. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I, I, uh, I guess just one one final question on um, you shared some ways that Jesus met you in some of those spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, what are I don't know, like so for me um, in being known and being loved there almost isn't a day go, that goes by where I don't wake up and ask God if he's still there, you know, like, are you right. still there? Kind of expecting that he won't be one of these days. Uh, Mm -hmm. But every day he's still there and him believing in me and like being faithful to me and loving me is teaching me how to love myself and be faithful to those around me. And and just like that kind of like loyalty where he's just like always there and what he went through so that he could know what it feels like to be me, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. are remarkably important, uh, like deep in my soul. And they're they're changing the shape of my soul as time goes by and as he continues just to be faithful to me, what are maybe some, some aspects of like Jesus and Jesus knowing you that's been important to you in the midst of this journey? Um, gosh, (laughs) just, I guess, you know, I, because I have a hard time feeling loved, yeah. Um, that tends to go with God too. Yeah. I often kind of shake my fist and be like, you know, why are you doing this to me? Why am I having to go through this? You know, what, why did I have to go through that all by myself? And yeah. nobody was there for me. Yeah. Um, and you know, I just, I've, I've had, you know, I, I was telling somebody recently that, you know, sometimes you can have these experiences. I, I guess you could call them God experiences. And, 
you know, they'll affect you at the time and you'll be on fire for God. And then it sort of fades away and you're back to having real world problems again. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, for an example, for example, there was um, another thing I don't talk about often. Um, several years ago, there was a minister that was abusive towards me mm. and it was, it triggered my self harming to get really severe to the point where I was cutting myself at least three or four times a week, oftentimes mm. more. Yeah. And I had two suicide attempts the same year. Mm. Um, first one was another drug overdose. I took 9,000 milligrams of sleeping pills. Mm. And the other one, I tried to slip my wrist and it caught me before I really did much. Huh. Um, you know, I ended up, cause I used to have this love for God. Like I was just on fire for him. I just, I wanted my life to be for him. And, you know, I would, I would read scripture and just get so much out of it. And I remember, I remember even praying sometimes, you know, God, when I die, I, I want it to be for your sake. You know, I want to give my life, not just living it for you. I, I want my life. I want to die for you someday. And, um, but because of what was going on with this minister, uh, <laughs> I ended up walking away from the faith hmm. and Nick was very concerned about that. And I told him, you know, if God wants me, he'll come for me. Hmm. And three days later, I, I had this dream and I was in this attic. It was very dark and very dusty. There was a little bit of light coming through from a window and I was in these chains and there are these giant demonic bugs they looked like they were part cockroach part man and they're holding these chains and jesus comes and i remember i just started blaspheming him and saying these horrible things and it was as if something was forcing me to say these things hmm. and i started crying and tears flowing from my face and i literally just say lord help me and he takes out this sword. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it had something to do with his blood. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And he cut the chains and the bugs went away. And I went up to him and I embraced him. I said, thank you. Thank you so much. And he told me, you are here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I woke up mm -hmm. and I, I was like, all right, God, you came for me, so <laughs> yes, know, he did. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um. No, yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question. But. It absolutely does. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, mm -hmm. constantly sh struck by the things he'll do to show us that he's with us and that he loves us. Mm hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Allie. Allie, it's been just so great being with you. Thank you again for sharing your story. I think it's one really important for guys to hear because it's sobering and it's real and it's honest. Mm -hmm. There's like kind of this delusion that porn doesn't impact anyone else except for ourselves. Right. And it's just not true. It changes. Well, it changes the way we view people and the way we treat mm -hmm. them. You know, it changes oh, yeah. the way that we interact across the board. And I mm -hmm. think then on the other end, I think it's important for our our female viewers to hear your story because uh, I think it imparts a lot of courage because um, you. your story is important and you are here for a reason. And I'm so glad that you're with us and that you're alive and I'm really you. grateful for you and, and Nick and the marriage that you have. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, guys, thank you for joining us. That was heavy and beautiful. Uh, if you want to check out um, Nick's ministry, it's Deeper Waters Apologetics. Would absolutely encourage that. He writes and podcasts regularly. Um, when it comes to this particular issue, guys, there are plenty of resources out there. 
Um, specifically for men, there's there's a, a curriculum and workbooks that Proven Men Ministries has that we have, and then for women as well, for proven we got proven wives and proven women, and those are available. Uh, going through this journey alone is awful, and I, I'm not entirely convinced that it's possible. Um, so there are things out there for you, and. Uh, yeah, uh, it's been really good to be with you guys. Allie, again, just so great to be with you. Um, and uh, if, yeah, if you uh, enjoyed this podcast, go ahead and give us a positive review. We'd really appreciate that. Um, Allie, thanks for everything. Hope you have just a great day and uh, looking forward to connecting with you and Nick again soon. Thank you. You too.